What I'd like to discuss with you today is actually the future of regenerative medicine. I'm Anthony Atala, and I was asked to talk to you today about how this field is going to impact our health care in the future. This is actually a picture of our medical center, and in the background you see the research park. Actually, it will be the largest urban research park in the country by the time it's completed, but the aerial photographer really didn't capture the whole area, so I asked him to please take his helicopter back up and take another picture, but he got a little bit carried away. This is actually a painting that hangs at the Harvard School of Medicine library, the Count Waite Library, and it shows the very first time that an organ was ever transplanted. In the foreground, you see Joe Murray, who actually was a surgeon who transplanted the first organ, happened to be the kidney, while in the back room you see the other surgeon harvesting the organ. This is actually, this painting depicts something that happened 53 years ago. We're still dealing with a lot of the same challenges in terms of organ shortage and organ rejection. And that is where this field comes in, regenerative medicine, which combines tissue engineering, cell therapies together to bring tissues and organs for replacement. And it means cells for therapy, like we could use these cells for Parkinson's or diabetes, tissues for therapy, like heart valves, or even organs for therapy. And we'll talk about some of these technologies. It's actually not a new field. It's really based on the field of cell transplantation. And many of you may not know this, but Charles Lindbergh, the same Charles Lindbergh who flew across the Atlantic in the 1920s, actually spent the rest of his life working at the Rockefeller Institute right here in New York City in the area of the culture of organs with Alexis Carrel, a French surgeon. And they actually published this book together back in the 1930s titled The Culture of Organs. The very first time that cells were used for therapy dates back to 1981. A patient with a skin burn at the Mass General Hospital in Boston had a very small piece of their skin taken. Cells were grown outside the body in large quantities, placed in a piece of gauze, and that dressing was placed over the patient's burn area with the patient's own cells. Very crude, yet it marks the very first time that cells were used for therapy. So if the field has been around for so long, why so few clinical advances? This really has to do with a major challenge dealing with a shortage of your own cells. It is very hard to take cells from a patient and grow normal cells outside the body in large quantities. And a lot of what we've done in this field uh, really relates back to trying to get these cells to grow outside the body, the cells within your own very uh, organs and tissues. And by looking at the molecular biology, cell interactions, bringing these together, we are now able to do so successfully for many different tissue types. Cells that we could not grow two decades ago, now, 2007, we can take a very small piece of tissue, less than half the size of a postage stamp, and by day 60, we can have enough cells to cover a football field. And by using these technologies, we can now start engineering tissues and organs. And this, are, this is just a uh, list of some of the tissues and organs we're working on at the Institute. The ones listed in yellow are by using normal cell populations within the patient's own tissues. The ones listed in white, we're using stem cell populations, and I'll describe those uh, to you. The strategy is actually quite simple. You start out with a very small piece of tissue from the patient's own organ. You then tease apart the component cells that are present within that tissue. You grow those cells out in large quantities, place them on a three-dimensional scaffold that to the naked eye looks like a piece of material, and then you implant that back into the body where it's able to form tissue, as you see here on the left lower quadrant. By following some of these strategies, we can now engineer different tissues, such as muscle or heart muscle or the cells that line blood vessels or even bone and cartilage. And by mixing and matching, we can create more complex structures. For example, if we were to take some of these uh, uh, muscle cells on the outside and we were to take some of these endothelial, which are the middle cells, these are the cells that line blood vessels, and we take a scaffold in the shape of a tube, and we seed or code the outside of this tubular scaffold with muscle cells and the inside with these vascular cells, 
we can create a blood vessel. And that's exactly what you see here. That's an engineered blood vessel that was created using these te techniques and highlighted in this journal, uh, Nature Medicine. We then just change different cell types to create different types of organs. For example, for a windpipe, the trachea, instead of using muscle cells, we use cartilage cells. And instead of using vascular or blood vessel cells, we use respiratory cells, and we can come up with the same kind of construct. One of the other technologies that has been uh, applied uh, both in the research arena and clinically includes the urethra, the urethra being the channel that connects the bladder to the outside of the body. What we do here is we basically have a patient that you see here with an injured urethra. That's the central segment that you see there that's narrow. We then cut out the injured area and we replace that in that same patient using these techniques. And you can see here, these are some of the scaffolds that we use to do so. And here's that same patient uh, six months later uh, using these techniques. And now you can see this, this is the post-operative picture six months later from that injured organ. And that was using uh, these types of techniques in these patients. So we now have over 100 patients to date we have treated using these uh, strategies or with over a five-year follow-up using these techniques. We then went on to uh, create uh, a, a whole organ, and this was a hollow organ. Tubular structures are complex, but not nearly as complex as hollow organs. Hollow organs have a higher degree of complexity because you're relying on the nerve uh, intervention to actually make the organ work. We did this for the bladder. We took a very small piece of the bladder uh, from the patient, less than half the size of the postage stamp. We then dissociated that specific tissue into its individual components, basically muscle and these very specialized bladder cells. We then expanded those cells in large quantities in an incubator, which is like an oven-like structure that keeps cells at the same conditions as your human body, basically 37 degrees centigrade, 95% uh, oxygen, 5% CO2. After 30 days, we had enough cells for a construct. We then took a scaffold in the shape of a bladder. This is a three-dimensional mold. It's designed to degrade once it's implanted into the, t into the body. We then coated the outside with these specialized muscle cells, the inside with these specialized bladder cells, and uh, basically from the time that we took the biopsy to the time that we implanted the organ back into the patient, it was approximately six weeks. We actually bring the patients in six weeks prior to their scheduled surgery. We do a 3D CT scan, which is an x-ray, which allows us to determine what the size of the bladder should be like. We then create a scaffold specifically for that patient, as you see here in the top two panels. Now, as we are going forward, of course, we're actually just uh, doing it in different sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. <laughs> it's true. But... <laughs> But basically, we then seat the cells, and we have the construct ready to be implanted, and it's implanted. Here's a patient who uh, you can see before surgery with a high-pressure uh, pathologic end-stage bladder. And on the right, you see the patient with the engineered organ uh, six months later. And we have now uh, tried these techniques in, uh, in patients with over a five-year follow-up. And we have shown that they do have improved function. They do have an improved quality of life. These patients are, are doing well. Uh, the work is still in progress, and these clinical trials are still ongoing. But we published our medical results uh, last year after having a five-year follow-up in all our patients and a seven-year follow-up in our uh, first patient uh, using these techniques. We have also tried to engineer solid organs. Now, hollow organs are definitely more complex than tubular structures, but not nearly as complex as solid organs, mainly because a solid organ requires added vascularity, added blood vessel, uh, blood flow going to the specific organ. And we did this for the kidney, the kidney being a solid organ. And we, it was highlighted in this journal, successful transplantation of cloned cells. And that is because we use cloned cells to create these organs. We actually took the cloned cells, we differentiated the cells to become kidney cells. We then grew these cells out in large quantities. We then seeded these cells onto these devices that are made out of collagen, which is a major material in your body. Once we seeded those cells onto that scaffold, we then implanted these into experimental models, and we were able to see the formation of these uh, kidney structures that were excreting and secreting fluid like the kidney should. And when we analyzed uh, the tissue, of course, 
under the microscope and uh, using molecular biology techniques, the tissue was consistent indeed with kidney. Now, these are small units, and our current work is uh, aimed at making these tissues uh, larger. We have also um, looked at many other tissues that it, it really, in terms of the time limit, we are not going to go into. But everything I've described thus far uses a patient's own cells. That is, you go to the patient who has a particular injury or disease, you take a very small piece of that tissue, you harness the normal progenitor cells, the cells which give rise to normal wound healing, we expand those cells outside the body and put them right back into the patient. But let's say you don't have that specific organ. Let's say you were only born with one kidney, and now there's a motor vehicle accident and you lose the only kidney you had. And now the year is 2020 or 2012. And they come to you, the patient comes to you and says, well, can you make me a kidney? Well, you don't have a kidney. How, how are we going to get the cells? That's where stem cells come in. And also for specific cell types that we just cannot grow today. There are several cell types that still cannot be grown outside the body, even today, 2007, like pancreatic cells, uh, which make uh, insulin, or liver cells, uh, or nerve cells, or heart cells. These cells we still cannot grow outside the body from the same patient. So for these cell types that we still can't grow, or if you don't have that specific organ, stem cells may be the answer. Now, there are two types of stem cells out there, human embryonic stem cells and adult bone marrow and cord blood stem cells, which have been out for many years. They've been described now for a number of years. What are human embryonic stem cells? Human embryonic stem cells basically have the potential to become any tissue or organ in the body. And they're very popular because they have a very high replicative potential. That is, we're able to have those cells grow in very large quantities outside the body. They double in number every 36 hours. The minus of the cells, every cell, every cell type has strengths and weaknesses. The weaknesses is that these cells do tend to form tumors. In fact, by definition, a human embryonic stem cell is not a human embryonic stem cell unless when implanted in tissue, it forms tumors. And it also has issues with rejection, mainly because if you take cells from one embryo and we put them in another patient, those cells will reject unless we immunosuppress the patient. We can use them, but we're going to have to use drugs to suppress the rejection response, just like we do today for kidney transplants or other types of transplants. Adult bone marrow stem cells or cord cells or what's uh, usually called adult stem cells, they have pluses and minuses as well. They have pluses because they have a very low malignant potential. They just don't form tumors. They can be used without rejection because we can take the cells from your own bone marrow and put them right back into your bone marrow. But the problem is that these cells are very hard to grow outside the body. So we're back to square one in terms of the challenge, especially with the cell types that we really need, like the cells that need to be driven into liver or pancreas or nerve. These cells are hard to grow. So approximately seven years ago, we started looking at an alternate source of stem cells. And the amniotic fluid is the fluid that bathes the baby in the developing womb in the mom as the baby's developing. And the placenta is the afterbirth. That is, in cases of baby during development, and when the baby's born, out comes the baby, and then comes the afterbirth, which is the placenta. And we were wondering whether we could isolate a stem cell population from these sources. And basically, about uh, seven years later, we just reported this a few months ago, that indeed we do have a stem cell population that is present within these two sources, from both the amniotic fluid and the placenta. And these cells are able to grow rapidly. They do double in number every 36 hours, just like human embryonic stem cells. And we're able to drive these cells into many different tissue types, such as bone, cartilage, kidney cells, muscle, blood vessel cells, nerves that uh, are secreting dopamine, which is something that can be used, for example, for Parkinson's disease, liver cells, which are secreting urea, which is a terminal product of the liver, that it means the liver is actually working, or pancreatic cells that can see, have the potential to secrete insulin. And by looking at these cells and studying these cells, we are able to show that we can direct these cells into many different tissue types, very similar to human embryonic stem cells. But when we look at these cells' characteristics and compare these, 
to other types, when we look at the growth potential, it's very similar to human embryonic stem cells. They double in number every 36 hours. However, they're not as, uh, they're not as powerful as human embryonic stem cells. Both cell types give rise to all three germ layers, but human embryonic stem cells are being obtained approximately 10 weeks earlier. These weeks are 10 weeks later, so they're not going to be as powerful as a human embryonic stem cell, but you are able to drive it to many different tissue types. And the cells will not reject and will not become malignant. Uh, they will not form tumors. Um, when, they, when you do inject them into tissue, they don't form tumors, and, and you could preserve these cells at the time of birth. So every time the baby is born, you can actually preserve the cells from the baby and from the mother uh, from the amniotic fluid and the placenta and have that be a natural repository of stem cells for the future. So basically, just a few months ago, we uh, published this paper, a new stem cell class, which is derived from amniotic fluid and the placenta. They are not human embryonic stem cells, and they are not adult stem cells. They are a stem cell class in between, and they all have, they, every cell type has their pluses and minuses, and it remains to be seen which cell type is going to be best for what indication. And that uh, was highlighted in this journal. Uh, that's where it was published, uh, uh, stem cells from the womb. Basically, what, we've tried to, uh, what I've tried to do really for you over the last uh, uh, 20 minutes is really give you an overview of where this uh, field is today. We do have uh, many different tissue types that we're working on, some which are already in patients uh, for several years, some which are in the pipeline in terms of getting to patients. And it's not really uh, a field that we can take for granted. There's a lot coming up in terms of the future. But it's something that we really need to be cautious and careful about. We have to go extremely slow. I always like to show this cartoon, how to stop runaway stage. And on the top panel, you see the stagecoach driver. And he goes A, B, C, D, E, F. He finally stops the runaway stage. And those are usually the basic scientists. And on the bottom panel, those are usually the surgeons. I'm a surgeon by training, actually, that's what I do. But really, when we talk about these technologies, we really do have to follow method one. That is, we really do have to be very careful as we advance these technologies to make sure that we keep our oath, primum non nocere, which means first do no harm, the oath that we all take uh, when we get our medical degree. And I think it's very important to, uh, to make sure that these technologies go slowly and carefully and cautiously as we're able to expand these technologies to other patients. Anytime we've launched something to the clinic, we've, treated, we've made absolutely sure that we could do everything we could experimentally before we ever put it into the patient. Once we put it into the patient, we treat one patient, we wait one year, we treat three patients, we wait six months, we open up the trial further, and we then wait until we have a five-year follow-up before we actually uh, uh, get our results out. And I think we have to follow that strategy to make sure that we are able to first rush these technologies to patients as fast as we can, but at the same time do so in a safe manner. Every one person dies every 30 seconds from diseases that could benefit from these technologies. If we're able to solve just one problem, let's say the kidney, at the bottom panel of this slide, the cumulative cost of health care to treat patients with kidney failure, with kidney disease, will exceed $1 trillion in the U.S. over the next 10 years. So we can save just one problem. We can save a lot of uh, resources that we can use uh, elsewhere. One of the major difficulties I have when I present this work is to, it sounds simple. I'm here I am presenting this, this work and, you know, look at this can be done, this can be done. In fact, I could pretty much uh, give you a one-week lecture uh, in terms of all the intricate problems we have with just getting one cell type to expand outside the body. So these are extremely complex technologies, and they require a multidisciplinary team uh, composed of many different types of scientists, molecular biologists, cell biologists, material scientists, chemical engineers, all coming together working to bring these technologies from the bench to the bedside. We have a wonderful team of uh, approximately 150 people at the Institute, uh, I'm just uh, presenting the work uh, from the team. We have an absolutely wonderful team, uh, and they deserve the credit for all, what I'm presenting to you today. And finally, to acknowledge some of our funding sources, which have made this work possible for us. And last but not least, to thank you for your attention. Thank you.